I think we can start. Welcome everyone to this week autonomy talks. This week is a great pleasure to have with us Professor Fei Miao, who is an assistant professor of uh, computer science and engineering at the University of Connecticut uh, since 2017. Uh, something about Fei, so she received her Bachelor of Science degree in automation from Shanghai Yao Tong University. And then she moved to US where she earned her PhD uh, in uh, electrical and systems engineering also with a master in statistics from UPenn. And by the way, she won the best doctoral dissertation award. Then she was for a while a postdoc at GRASP and, uh, and then she moved to, to Connecticut. Her research interests lie in the optimization, machine learning and control and in theory. And in general, she wants to address safety, efficiency and security challenges for cyber physical systems. She is a recipient of some NSF uh, awards, uh, among which we note the Career Award. And today she's gonna talk about learning and control for safety, efficiency, and security of cyber physical systems, uh, touching the application of mobility on demand, which is, uh, which is very important to the audience of Autonomy Talks. I'm personally very excited to hear more about the, this topic and therefore I give you the stage, Faye. Okay. Um, thank you for the introduction and uh, nice to uh, meet everybody virtually. Um, so uh, today I'm going to uh, talk about uh, uh, my research on learning and control for safety, efficiency, and security of cyber physical systems, which is the current uh, more focus of our group. So overall, my group uh, has been focusing on research in cyber physical systems with emphasize the tight integration of communication, computation, and the control of physical dynamic systems. So um, several physical systems include like transportation, autonomous vehicles, smart cities, medical devices, smart grids, manufacturing, etc. And uh, my research thus far has been mainly focusing on transportation, autonomous vehicles, and the smart cities. Um, so here is the agenda, the outline of today's talk. So I will include mainly three topics. So first, we'll talk about uh, data-driven robust optimization for uh, mobility on demand service to mainly address the efficiency issue of the system. And then I will briefly introduce our work on CPS security. And uh, finally, we will introduce our most recent uh, focus on safe and efficient multi-agent reinforcement learning and its application in connected autonomous vehicles. So the first part, um, this work is mainly supported by um, two NSF awards. And uh, the issues that I've been considering is, we have seen that in large scale transportation systems, nowadays with the increasing amount of data, what we have seen is the complicated dynamics of large scale systems, usually it involves a lot of model uncertainties. So even with machine learning techniques that we can uh, attract model information from data and still we cannot ignore the model uncertainties there. To improve the system efficiency and the sort of the conflict of uh, uh, like a different uh, objectives of stakeholders, we have to make decisions while addressing these model uncertainties. And uh, for the making decision part, we we consider uh, optimization techniques, which can describe and define our objectives. And we will utilize control theories that which we can find out decisions based on our model. So. Along this topic, our contributions have been mainly uh, these three fours. So first, we design algorithms to construct model prediction uncertainties from data. And then based on the uncertainty sets of the model, we de design distribution robust optimization methods that we can find out computationally tractable solutions and also guarantee the worst case expected cost of the system and their model uncertainties. And we uh, uh, validate our methodology design on real world system data for both traditional gasoline taxi data and also EV taxi data. And uh, in the literature, usually mobility on demand system did not consider model uncertainties. So first, the motivation of this research topic comes from the current unbalanced or inefficient smart city service. So for example, um, the EV's adoption rate has increasing very fast um, in the world. But meanwhile, for 
mobility on demand service or for taxi service, we still see this sort of unbalanced service that places with high demand may only have a supply and especially in large cities. Um, so it is hard for the drivers to say, okay, just react after this sort of uh, busy region of peak hour already uh, appear. So um, if we only assume that we already know the demand and the very accurate prediction about demand and make the vehicle balancing decision among the entire city, that will not really uh, work well. So we have to consider say, okay, with the uh, rapid expansion of EV and if EV provide uh, uh, autonomous mobility on demand system in the city um, and considering the very unique dynamic charging process, uh, when it's hard to predict the real charging time, which caused the uncertainty on both the supply side and the mobility demand side. So how can we really address these uncertainty in the prediction on the demand and supply side and then make uh, vehicle balancing decisions to improve the entire system's efficiency? So that is the main challenges we want to address. So first, let's see what we can get from data set. So usually, um, the mobility system data, transportation data, that's spatial temporal data. So um, we have, uh, for example, uh, historical and also like a real time stream data uh, show us the trip information uh, either taken by taxi or mobility on demand system. Uh, and the, in big cities uh, like Shenzhen in China, there are already like a, a tens of thousands of EV taxis serving people's mobility demand in the city every day. So this sort of data usually shows the trip information. And according to the trip information, like a region destination at a different time of one day, we can basically aggregate uh, the demand, uh, mobility demand at uh, different regions of the city uh, at maybe, for example, every hour of uh, uh, one day. So according to this sort of aggregated uh, mobility demand data, we can utilize uh, machine learning techniques such as like a time series analysis, long short term memory neural network or transformer neural network to predict, for example, at specific hours of one day, what is the total mobility demand at the different regions of the city. Um, but here, instead of uh, saying just improve the prediction accuracy, since no method can really be 100% accurate, we consider that um, there is a prediction error and uh, the type of uh, uncertainty sets we want to build is about basically this uh, error or this like a residual between the prediction and the true demand. And our methodology here is we utilize the idea of bootstrap basically repeated experiments, repeated sampling data technique from statistical literature, and then uh, run through every model. We can have like a, the prediction residuals by the repeated experiments, and we can build the confidence region of the S and mean and covariance of the residual. And we can then, based on this confidence region, build close and convex uncertainty sets. So for example, the uncertainty sets can be just a simple, um, the, the range format, like shows, for example, 95% confidence region of the lower bound and the upper bound of like the total demand at each region. And it can also be a more complicated, for example, moment-based, a second moment-based uh, format. It takes like the mean and the covariance information and uh, formulate this uncertainty sets. And we design algorithm to construct the uncertainty sets, the, these specific parameters, how does that related to, for example, a certain uh, value of a confidence region. And we proved that uncertainty sets parameters are guaranteed to be contained in a certain confidence regions with our desired like a probability. So the first step, we built the uncertainty sets. And then this is the uh, overall structure of uh, uh, the vehicle balancing algorithm. So basically this is a dynamic robust optimization process like utilize the idea of model predictive control. So at every step, we first uh, update the current of uh, true location and occupancy and status information of all these uh, mobile on demand vehicles in the systems. And we also like update our uh, demand prediction model for the next uh, several time steps and uh, utilizing our prediction uh, about uh, like the residual uncertainty sets to construct basically our uh, uncertainty model for the uh, next few time slots prediction. And then 
this is a key step uh, for the robust optimization. So with all these like updated uh, uh, status of vehicles, and we basically make our decision, say this is by solving a distribution robust optimization problem that we care about providing fair service and efficient service across different regions of the city to uh, uh, through balancing the vehicles. And then we send the decision to all these vehicles. And we assume there is also a local controller within each region that can specifically match the vehicle with uh, passengers. So this part uh, uh, relatively has a, a better uh, research literature. So here we, uh, in the simulation, we just uh, utilize some uh, like, uh, for, for example, integer programming uh, methods to do this sort of matching. And uh, in the next few slides, I will mainly talk about this system level vehicle balancing, how we do this through uh, DRO. So here is the uh, problem formulation part. So the first objective, uh, uh, for example, at uh, every time slot, we uh, have predicted demand at different regions, and we know the current like a true location uh, of all these occupied and the weekend vehicles. So basically, we know what is the true supply at the different regions at this time step. So the dispatch decision will be the total number of vehicles we will reallocate uh, uh, be between region I to region G. And uh, first, because through this, uh, vehicle balancing process, these are like just the weekend vehicles without passengers on it. We want to make sure that this rebalancing, this idle mileage is not too much. So this is, uh, we, we assume this is like just a linear uh, function of the rebalancing decision. So, and the second objective is we want to provide this fire service in the sense that the supply demand ratio at every uh, local region is close to the global supply demand ratio, basically. And uh, the objective function is the weighted sum of these two parts, fair service and with a minimum idle driving distance. And now let's see, okay, so what happened if we uh, assume the predicted demand satisfies some uh, uh, probability distribution and the probability distribution is within some set instead of saying this predicted demand is some deterministic value. So the main difficulty comes from this fair service uh, objective part. This absolute value function, um, it's not a concave format of the uncertain parameter R. So um, to make it possible to find out a continuously tractable uh, convex optimization equivalent format, the first thing we do here is we prove that this absolute value function objective can be approximated as this fractional format. Uh, and uh, we prove that this function, it is actually concave and actually linear of the uncertain parameter, and it is convex of our decision variable. So the, the decision variable x is basically this s is the linear function of the decision variable x. And uh, um, through simulation, we can see that when this alpha is greater than zero, but uh, close to zero, basically the approximation error between these two functions are also close to zero. This is our first step. And then the a DRO problem formulation turns to this format that the objective function part, the weighted sum of these two functions, this JD is basically a, a linear function of X. And the, this part is also a concave function of X. And all these constraints part, these are either uh, linear, in, uh, these are either linear inequalities or include some convex part. And later I will show the specific uh, problem formulation. But overall, the problem formation is like this. We want to minimize the worst case expected cost of the vehicle balancing to provide fair service to the system. And we prove that uh, according to this problem formulation, we basically can find out an equivalent convex optimization format for this min-max problem, which can minimize the worst case expected cost. And also we can solve the problem basically uh, in polynomial time. And we then have a vehicle balancing decision or general resource allocation decision for mobility on demand systems. So the main contribution here is uh, where the first to consider 
the uh, prediction uncertainty for mobility on demand service. And by uh, formulating a problem that is concave of the dis uh, uncertain parameter and convex of the decent variable, we basically can find out a computational tractable solutions for the system. And here is a specific uh, uh, problem format. And this F is an uncertainty set. And here we uh, address the prediction demand part uncertainty. And uh, finally, this problem is some uh, a convex optimization with a, a linear objective function and with some like a quadratic format of constraints. So uh, now let's see if uh, we specifically consider EVs to provide mobility on demand service, what do we have missing? So the demand side uh, mobility uncertainty part that's basically based on the passenger's mobility demand. So that part of uncertainty still exists. But meanwhile, we have an additional resource of uncertainty, the supply side, because EVs through the uh, service providing process, it also needs to do the charging. And uh, um, though there is a uh, rich literature of predicting the charging like a uh, uh, time or uh, charging, for example, uh, the queuing process, et cetera, but still um, it, it, it's hard to say like the charging time prediction is very accurate. And hence we cannot just assume, say, we know exactly through the dynamic process at, at uh, the future time slots, what will be the uh, EV supply at different regions. That will be like a very strong assumption for, for the system. So here, basically we consider both the mobility demand part and also the EV uh, supply side of uncertainty. And uh, our vehicle balancing decision also includes two parts. So, so the first part, we still need to balance weekend and uh, uh, EVs with enough battery that to other regions to pick up uh, uh, passengers. And we we'll also need to balance in the charging process for the EVs. So for example, when we decide these vehicles to go to different charging stations, we want to make sure that the utilization rate at the different charging stations are close. Hence, there won't be like a, uh, stations with very long queue and other stations without many EVs charging. So we, we also want to balance the utilization rate of the charging stations. So, and then here, the um, we are co-balancing problems formulation is like this. Um, still, it's uh, a minimized worst case expected cost formulation, a DRO format of problem. And here we consider multiple sources of uh, uh, uncertainty. So we put the fair charging requirement in this objective function. And for the fair mobility service part, we put it uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the constraint. So to do this, because we, want, we also need to decouple the mutual dependency between the EV supply and the mobility demand. So for example, if we put uh, supply demand ratio just in one fractional, then this sort of min-max problem will be very difficult to solve. Or even we found out the solution, it's uh, uh, just uh, some approximation and may be far away from like the real min-max guarantee we want to have here. So we, we, we first uh, decouple the uh, mobility uh, demand uh, uncertainty and uh, supply uncertainty and uh, put one in the objective function, another in the uh, constraint function. So here we can still reach uh, charging fairness objective and mobility fairness constraint uh, in this one optimization problem. And uh, still this problem, it is uh, uh, convex format uh, for the decision variables and it's concave actually linear for the uncertain parameters. And uh, according to this problem formulation, we can prove an equivalent convex optimization format for this DRO problem that we can guarantee basically the worst case expected cost of uh, this EV mobility on demand system. And uh, here is uh, uh, basically the detailed uh, uh, like a equivalent convex optimization format, uh, long story short. So basically here we now have two uncertainty sets. One uncertainty set describes our prediction on the mobility demand, and the other describes our prediction on the EV charging supply, considering like this dynamic process. 
and, and again, here we assume we have uh, uh, historical data and uh, it shows us uh, both the pattern of picking up and the, the charging dynamics of the EVs. And finally, this optimization problems, again, it's some problem with, I think here this time it is a quadratic objective function and with quadratic constraints, basically. And now let's see our algorithm performance on some real world data set. So for example, here I um, mainly show our experiments based on um, a, a, a Shenzhen, the Chinese city's uh, data uh, where um, they uh, adopt EV relatively early. So nowadays there are already like a, a tens of thousands of uh, EV taxis providing the mobility service. So first, we show based on the EV data, what is the prediction result? So for example, we predict both um, the EV supply and also um, the uh, people's mobility demand. And uh, here we show that at a different times of one day, even they utilize, for example, uh, LSTM neural network model uh, from the uh, literature and also, for example, the ARIMA's kind of time series model. At uh, some uh, uh, hours, the prediction error can still be as high as 15%. And this is also similar to these literature paper when they use, for example, other kinds of data set to predict the mobility demand. So um, that's why we, uh, we say, okay, we cannot just uh, uh, simply ignore the prediction error and assume this prediction is accurate. And then we um, testify our uh, uncertainty set construction algorithms based on this data set. And uh, for example, we select the different uh, thresholds parameters to get uh, uh, the uncertainty sets. And basically we can show that uh, uh, with our uh, model, of uh, uh, answering sets construction, we can reduce the variance of the answering sets. So it means that, okay, so uh, by adjusting uh, like the uh, boost type uh, time parameter and uh, some other thresholds in the answering sets construction algorithms, uh, on the uh, model uncertainty part, we also get a relatively uh, accurate uh, estimation. So uh, if the uncertainty set is just arbitrarily large, then the performance can also be very bad. So actually the uncertainty set prediction parts, we also need to uh, make sure that uh, our estimation about uh, the model uncertainty the base plate, uh, uh, is very close to the real like a confidence region of these data. And now uh, based on the uncertainty set, we, we, we built from data, we compare our uh, DRO optimization problem cost with uh, some baselines and we show that uh, our methods can improve both the um, efficiency and the robustness of the system in the sense that uh, the average cost is reduced. So for example, if we uh, just uh, in compare the idle driving distance, it's reduced by uh, about like 15%. And uh, if you also compare the the charging fairness and the mobility service fairness, um, a smaller a number uh, means a, a, a better uh, service because we calculate the difference between the local region and the global, the entire city. So small means better. So we also show our algorithms can basically um, reduce the charging and mobility service unfairness throughout the entire city. So uh, that's basically the first part of our work about mobility on demand service. Um, so um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to take. Um, okay, so I will first proceed and then uh, later answer questions. Uh, so the second topic, I will briefly introduce our work on CPS security. So I have been working on this since my uh, PhD, uh, and currently we still have uh, uh, active awards that uh, support us to do this part of research. And basically, the problems we consider here is for cyber physical systems, it's special that the cyber attacks can also cause disasters in the physical dynamics component. And meanwhile, our knowledge about the physical dynamic process can also help us to improve the system's resiliency and help us to detect if there are any attacks happening in the system. So um, along this topic, I have been mainly working on hybrid stochastic game um, to design resilient control for CPS. And I will also design a coding scheme for stealthy data injection attacks 
and also utilizing machine learning techniques to do attack localization for power systems, uh, for attacks we define as power bound net attacks. And I've also collaborated with my colleague to work on a game theoretic security uh, framework for quantum key distributions, et cetera. So today I will uh, mainly introduce the stochastic game for cyber physical system resiliency. So um, in this problem, we assume that um, the system dynamics is a uh, uh, very uh, traditional uh, linear time environment, uh, linear time environment system. And uh, on the uh, control part, we assume that we, we can have a, a set of uh, controller state estimators and the detectors that the system can uh, switch among these subsets. And uh, for the uh, attack part, we assume that um, the attacker basically it can uh, uh, manipulate uh, uh, the sensor environments uh, through this uh, uh, communication network. And uh, um, the key uh, challenge here is, so if we don't care about like the security investment and uh, um, we, 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 we don't uh, restrict, uh, for example, the, the cost of the system pay for improving the resiliency, then uh, that's okay. But in the real world, uh, the challenge is there is always a trade-off between higher security, higher uh, attack detection rate or uh, improve the resiliency of the system and um, the operation cost of the system. So basically we want to make sure that uh, we, we improve the resiliency of the system, but with a relatively efficient way, right? So instead of just uh, paying like uh, unlimited cost, on improving the security part. So on the attacker side, for the system, there can be different types of attack and uh, different uh, uh, state estimators and the detectors are good at detecting different types of attack, but we have no idea at a specific time, uh, at specific dynamic steps, which types of attack really uh, appear. So we have to make our choice and uh, uh, deciding basically, okay, what, what is a really good way to really like implementing these uh, uh, controller state estimator and the detector in the system to improve the resiliency. So the contributions here we have made is we design a zero sum hybrid state stochastic gain that we can minimize the worst case cost of the system to balance the security overhead and we also develop an algorithm to calculate the mix of strategies for a finite stage game of the system and prove that the suboptimality of the switching control strategy. And we also develop an efficient uh, resync horizon algorithm for infinite stage game. So to be specifically, this problem formulation uh, is very, sm uh, very similar to, for example, the uh, our familiar Markov game uh, formulation. Uh, the main difference here is because the systems under attacks now it becomes to a hybrid system. So for example, it can be at a different state, either a safe state means attack already detected, or there is no uh, attack detection yet, or there is some false alarm. So we also design a hybrid state game to describe this uh, state transition of the system, while the discrete state basically describes uh, describes the uh, like a, the uh, security stage and the continuous state basically describe the physical dynamic state of the system. And uh, the system's action space, including selecting from a, a different a combination of the controller state estimators and detectors. And attacker's action space include the selecting different types of attacks. And uh, uh, for example, no attack is also included in uh, attacker's action space. And the state transition probability is described by, for example, it's related to the uh, attack detection rate of different uh, uh, detectors. And the payoff at each stage is uh, uh, basically, we assume this is a zero sum game between the system and the attacker and the system want to minimize the cost and the attacker want to maximize the cost. And for example, we can use uh, uh, linear quadratic cost, um, which we often use in, in MPC for the system. And uh, here we consider mixed strategies for each player. 
So um, we first define, for example, the, 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 pay, the payoff of the objective uh, the system want to minimize as uh, the total uh, reward of, of uh, uh, the system or the total, uh, total payoff of the system in a finance stage, for example. And then we define the value of the game and the optimal strategy. Uh, the definition is similar to uh, the min-max uh, definition in, in, in most like zero-sum problem. And here the challenge is because the state is hybrid state instead of like just the only continuous state or only discrete state. So the PL function and the dynamic uh, uh, state and the strategy, they affect each other. And uh, um, we have to design, for example, a, a, a novel uh, backward propagation algorithm to calculate the policies. And the idea here is for designing the algorithm, we first uh, uh, get the pure strategy, like a Q function sets, um, to use that to represent basically the convex hull of all possible uh, Q matrices. And then we get the maximum of the min max value of all these like a possible Q functions and the, the corresponding strategies from uh, the last stage K backward to stage one. And then we calculate uh, and then we get uh, basically the mix uh, strategy through the entire process. So we proved that this algorithm basically it can uh, use an upper bound for the value of the k-stage gain together with a suboptimal strategy, and we basically can prove the difference. And here, how uh, we show some uh, uh, simulation on uh, like a, a very uh, simple style of game, say here we only consider two possible controllers for the system, uh, like uh, the uh, attack we consider here is a replay attack. And uh, uh, basically we show that with our game strategy, the system will find out a balance between uh, security investment and uh, the uh, operational cost. And we, we basically we show that uh, with this, with our game strategy, we keep a relatively reasonable good, like a detection rate of the replay attack. And meanwhile, the, the cost is much better than like a, just uh, applying um, the controller with a very high detection rate, but also high cost. So basically the conclusion here is game policies reduce the average control cost compared with high cost of security environments to control methods. And it can, it can also detect the attack with comparable detection rate. And we also have some other simulations, but due to the time constraint, I won't show this here. And all the detail is included in the paper. So basically this is, is our um, second topic. And uh, uh, last but not least, I will introduce our uh, recent focus on safe and efficient multi-agent reinforced learning for networked cyber physical systems, which is supported by my career award. And uh, the basic idea here is we want to understand the tri-directional relationship among communication, learning, and control for networked CTS. And we want to design uh, multi-agent reinforced learning techniques together with the control framework uh, for the coordination of uh, systems like a connected autonomous vehicles to guarantee the safety of the system for like a hybrid uh, model uncertainties. And we also want to define, formally quantify and validate the benefits of communication on improving the system's safety and efficiency and validate all the designs through simulators and also uh, test the So currently, we, we already have these f 10 vehicles in our lab and uh, uh, in uh, connected state, uh, the state of DOT is launching uh, several connected Tom's vehicles buses, and hopefully we can do the demo next year. So uh, the main contribution uh, here is uh, some uh, uh, techniques design, for example, uh, communications through multi-agent uh, systems, but uh, um, there is not uh, uh, like a scientific quantification uh, uh, formal definition about the communication uh, for the ben uh, benefits yet. So along this line, uh, this is a journal still under review. And we first design a, a multi-agent reinforcement learning techniques that 
utilize control methods as feedback to provide like the safety guidance part for the reinforcement learning process and uh, uh, demonstrate its efficiency on CAV systems. So the basic idea here, or the challenges we want to focus on is for a hybrid system, usually we have uh, several uh, objectives to consider. We want to improve the system level efficiency. And meanwhile, we also want to guarantee say, each individual agent in the system is operating safely. And for making uh, behavior planning decisions for the CVs, so for example, if um, if the CVs they are running on streets, the actions include like uh, should uh, each vehicle change lane or, or keep lane, and then if to do the change lane or keep lane maneuver, what will be the specific control input? For making these sort of decisions, the uh, centralized multi-agent reinforcement learning technique won't work because it's not uh, scalable. So and uh, also for a dynamic system. If we just assume when we have even hundreds of agents, we can have a centralized critic that getting all the agents uh, joint state and actions, that's also unrealistic. So we have to consider how we can design basically a, a scalable multi-agent reinforcement learning methods to uh, improve the system's efficiency. And also um, uh, throughout the training and the testing process, we need to have some like additional uh, safety guarantee or safety shield designed to this algorithm to make sure that uh, uh, the system is functioning well. So uh, our method here is first, instead of uh, assuming like uh, we have a critic ha uh, can include the uh, global state and action, we design what is called a truncated queue function. So when CVs, they can share their state and action with neighbors, we just assume that uh, every uh, uh, autonomous vehicle, they just uh, take this shared state and action information to, uh, to uh, design their uh, queue function. And basically by utilizing this uh, local state and action information, we prove that the approximation error of the truncated queue function compared with a, a centralized queue function with a global state and action, it is bounded. And the bounding error is related to basically like the stage-wise reward function and the, and the discounted reward factor. So this is the first step, the scalability uh, challenge. Uh, to use uh, to design a truncated queue function. And the second step is about through the training and testing process, how we can improve the safety of reinforcement learning. So um, instead of just using, for example, negative reward for, uh, for, for, for unsafe actions, here we um, um, utilize the idea of a control barrier function uh, to basically provide a feedback to the reinforcement learning process. And the basic idea here is uh, when uh, the uh, reinforcement learning methods explore some action, it will go through the uh, control barrier function process by solving the CBF QP problem to find out that the corresponding action, whether there exists a feasible safe uh, control input to basically execute this action. If it that exists, that means this action is safe. And if it doesn't exist, then the action is unsafe and the, all these results will be feedback to the reinforcement learning process. And for unsafe action, we will basically just uh, um, uh, explore another action and until uh, we found out that this is a, a safe action. And uh, for the uh, uh, control barrier function, basically we want to maintain uh, like a safe distance among the autonomous vehicle and the other environmental vehicles. So the theorems we have proved here is basically with the, the safe action feedback through uh, solving the CBF quadratic program uh, controller, we can basically provide a provable safety guarantee for the actions taken in both the training and the execution stage for the reinforcement learning. And uh, uh, the dynamic systems hybrid state uh, always remains within a safe set. So, um, because this is an autonomous vehicle system, and uh, all the state information we assume this is uh, uh, getting through the 
computer, computer vision process, basically we have a laser point data and a camera data that we can utilize to estimate like the uh, uh, locations of the surrounding vehicles and the lens number of the surrounding vehicles, et cetera. And uh, um, the main challenge here is when these CVs, they also want to share their state estimation with the neighboring vehicle. We have to make sure that this state estimation uh, can be processed in real time. And we found out that uh, usually LIDAR point cloud is processed uh, uh, much slower than camera data. So um, we also designed some like model compression techniques to basically um, reduce the uh, computation time of the uh, uh, object detection data. And uh, we have some like other uh, publications for this part. And uh, uh, with these like a, uh, uh, share the state information in the re uh, multi-agent reinforcement learning process. Here we show basically uh, through the MARL how we can improve the system's efficiency and the safety. So first step, we uh, use, uh, we utilize a simulation tool called CARLA and compare see when there is different uh, a ratio of autonomous vehicles uh, in this map. So there can also be, for example, uh, other uh, human driving vehicles. We don't control them. They don't follow our, for example, uh, uh, CV uh, uh, trend policies. Um, so with different ratios of autonomous vehicles, we can show that the average velocity and average driving comfort of the system has been improved through this safe and efficient MAR algorithm. And uh, we also show that uh, uh, the safety is improved in the sense that uh, um, uh, even through the training process, because we basically we have a CVF uh, QP problem to provide the feedback to the reinforcement learning part. If it's unsafe action, basically we won't we won't take it. So we we compare, for example, the the, the headway distance between the uh, eagle vehicle and uh, the uh, proceeding vehicles, and we uh, prove that with our uh, safe MAR methods, it's better than the baseline. That even through the training process, we reduce like the uh, the, the 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 failure time. And uh, if we also keep this uh, uh, safety uh, shield through the testing process, and basically there, there won't be crash accidents for the autonomous vehicles. And we also show some scenario called obstacle at the corner. So I think here I want to, I can show basically this video, the experimental result. Like here, first step is the um, efficiency demonstration. So with our uh, methods, there won't be uh, any crash, but the baselines, uh, literature methods cannot guarantee that. And also with our model, the efficiency is improved because the objective is set as the autonomous vehicles want to improve, for example, the average traffic flow on the streets. And it will choose to uh, change them or keep them according to which action is better to uh, in, improve the uh, efficiency of the entire transportation system. And also we demonstrate this uh, obstacle at corner scenario in the sense that when there's some accident at the corner, if the autonomous vehicles, they cannot see the accident until they reach here, then will, there will be a, basically a traffic jam here on this left lane. But when there is information sharing, those autonomous vehicles, they, they get the information see, okay, this part, uh, the, the, the average speed is very low. So uh, like this car, we will choose to uh, change lane because this middle lane, the average speed is still faster. And uh, these autonomous vehicles change lane before they approach the corner. So they basically can avoid this traffic jam. Uh, so um, uh, the, the previous work, this uh, first step, we just assume that, for example, these uh, autonomous vehicles, these connected vehicles, they want to cooperate uh, uh, to improve the traffic system's efficiency. Uh, and uh, we just assume all these CVs follow our control algorithms, follow our reinforcement learning trend policies. But in the real world, there's also 
challenge to say, okay, so um, what if these agents uh, originally they may not want to collaborate? So how can we design some uh, uh, reward uh, reallocation scheme, say, to motivate them to collaborate? and make sure that once they collaborate, the correlation they form is actually a stable correlation. So starting from this motivation, uh, this uh, we uh, recently published a paper in this year's ECRA. So it's about stable and uh, efficient reward reallocation for collaborative policy learning in multi-agent reinforcement learning. So the basic idea here is we formulate uh, an MARL problem uh, that the reward function uh, definition is different from the traditional problem. Say, usually traditional reinforcement learning, the reward is just a function of the state and action. But here, we define the reward as a function of state and action, and also correlation. A correlation here means uh, uh, cooperating groups. So for example, uh, it can be the correlation is just that each individual agent in the system means that they just care about their own objective. Or the correlation can also be, okay, we have five agents and the, um, two is one correlation, the other three is another correlation, it means these two uh, agents cooperating and the other three, they are cooperating. And it, it can also be uh, where ideal case say, okay, all these N agents, they are, they are coordinating, then the entire N agent set, this is a, like a big correlation. So, each agent is also associated with a policy and the policy basically is choosing action according to like which correlation they are in and which state they're at, right? So if all the agents cooperate, then uh, we have the system's total reward, uh, basically it's the sum of the reward. So um, here we, we consider the problem as, okay, so, um, we want to motivate these agents to cooperate, and when they cooperate, basically, uh, they will maximize the system level reward. But meanwhile, uh, because their reward will change depending on uh, whether they are only cooperating in a very small group or whether the entire big group is is cooperating. So here, the problem is okay. So if we want to motivate them to all cooperate, then uh, basically, each agent has their contribution to improve the system-wise reward. And how we can reallocate the grand correlation's total reward to each agent, such that each agent will be will, willing to form this grand correlation and cooperate to improve the system-wise uh, uh, reward. So basically, we want to find a stable and efficient total reward reallocation for all agents under the grand correlation. To solve this challenge, we first designed an, uh, a game called Transferable Utility Game as a tool that the value of any correlation given the current state is de defined as a function. And see, so different from traditional uh, modern reinforcement learning here, the value function is also related to uh, the correlation these agents form. And uh, we, uh, prove that the reward relocation scheme utilizes the very uh, classical concepts of uh, uh, Shapley value in game theory that basically Shapley value defined the, the marginal contribution of each agent to the correlations. So, so basically here, uh, this function calculates, this equation calculates that uh, if the agent I can formulate uh, different correlations among all these a N agents, what is its like average marginal contribution to, to uh, each correlation? And uh, this value will be the agent I's total reward uh, it can get by like the formulating a grand correlation. And basically this reward is proportional to its total marginal contribution to the entire system. And uh, the outcome of uh, uh, of uh, this utility game defined as one is the correlation structure. And the second part is basically the payoff factor for each agent given the current state and action. So we have proved the theorem that when we use Shapley value to uh, define uh, the uh, reward for each agent in the system, basically we, we get an efficient outcome 
for the transferable utility game that uh, the Shapley value is an efficient reward allocation. Efficient here means that the outcome of the entire system total reward is completely distributed to each agent, means like a, um, nothing is left. So all these agents basically just get their portion through the entire system's reward. And we also proved that this Shapley value, it is a stable uh, uh, outcome, means that all these agents or all these CVs, vehicles, they will just stay within the correlation. Uh, like here, we design uh, the grand correlation as our objective. They will stay in within the correlation. They will communicate and cooperate, basically follow the uh, policies uh, learned through this process. They will uh, stay in the correlation and cooperate with other correlation members to optimize like the entire system level's objective. And we proved these two parts. And the algorithms to learn uh, the uh, uh, reward and to learn the policies through the process is the main steps uh, comparing to uh, the traditional MRR algorithm here is through the iteration process, we need to calculate the current uh, uh, Shapley value of these agents and then uh, basically use this Shapley value uh, to find out uh, a, a critic in the actor critic algorithm process. And uh, here we show the key steps. So uh, the main difference is again, here the reward and the value function is related to uh, like the specific correlation the agent is in. So the, uh, prop, uh, the, the property of these algorithms is validated through experiments. And uh, uh, we, we show that basically uh, with our method, uh, the entire system can get larger uh, mean episode reward because these agents they are willing to cooperate. And again, we show that uh, the uh, average velocity and average comfort improvement uh, for the entire system when there is a different uh, CAV uh, ratios. And uh, basically reward function or the objective function of the entire system, it, calc uh, it cares about two things. First is average velocity of the entire system, and the second is average comfort. Uh, and I think uh, these are basically uh, the third topics uh, for today's talk. So I want to uh, thank you to all my PhD students and also all the undergraduate uh, researchers. And uh, also we, we, we currently have some like high school students together with us to uh, work on these autonomous vehicles. And here is, uh, uh, here is a summary of today's talk. I mainly introduced three topics, um, data-driven robust optimization, uh, hybrid stochastic game, and uh, our recent multi-agent reinforcement learning to address the safety, security, and efficiency challenges of CTS. And in the future, we will still continue to work on fundamental theories, algorithm designs, and uh, simulation test bed validations uh, uh, for our uh, methodologies to address the real world uh, network the CPS challenges. And some future work here is we're currently also working on robust multi-agent reinforcement learning when there is state perturbations in the system. And we have also continually working on, say, formally define the benefit of uh, communication and information sharing in multi-agent reinforcement learning. And uh, still, we have currently active research projects for data-driven decision-making in smart cities and CPS securities. Uh, I think I want to stop here and uh, take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Faye, for the great talk. A lot of interesting things. Um, let's see, let's open the stage for questions. You can either unmute yourself or ask in the chat. Let's see if there are questions. If not, I can maybe start breaking the ice. Uh, so I actually, uh, very interesting, all the parts of the talk. I was uh, particularly interested in the first one. Um, and I had some questions uh, regarding this, uh, this application of mobility on demand. Mm -hmm. So the first point I wanted to ask you is, um, uh, how does this play with the rest? So you mentioned you, you write this optimization problem for the rebalancing, right? Yes. Um, but so, so it means that you are 
imagining this to work in real time or on operation time together with the other uh, pieces of the pipeline, like the matching, the routing, and so on, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it means that you have tested it also for uh, for realistic settings with the cities. Like I, I saw the New York data set you were using, and, and this works uh, works in a realistic setting as well. Uh, yes. So 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 basically, uh, um, so uh, in in this talk, I mainly show like a data from. Uh, um, data from uh, Shenzhen City's EV. And uh, actually we also, uh, the New York City data is actually public online. So basically, um, uh, so for uh, example here, so it's actually, it includes, a full, it, it includes uh, like a four years of taxi data uh, yes. in total, like a 700 million trips of New York City. So like through the uh, training testing process, we can just uh, utilize the, like cross validation ideas in machine learning. So partition the data set and part is as training, part as testing. And so then um, uh, using the training data to estimate, estimate the SME sets and using the testing data to run through this MPC process and uh, yeah. run the simulation, yeah. Okay, so th that's very cool because it's, uh, th this leads to the second question because as far as I know, the state of the art for this rebalancing problem I mean, there are many works, but one of the works was uh, by Pavone at Stanford with the yeah. LSTM. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I think if I remember correctly, in one slide, you were showing some drawbacks of these approaches, like the- Yeah, ever... so on the prediction side. On the prediction side. Okay, okay. Yeah. Very cool. And maybe my second question related to this uh, was uh, about the fairness, and it was more a conceptual question. So. Uh, when you formulated the problem, I didn't get exactly how fairness was modeled. So you had two two fairnesses, right? There's char charging fairness yeah. and the mobility fairness. Mm -hmm. But can you explain again quickly uh, how do they work? So what exactly do they model? Sure. Uh, let me go back to like the original uh, definition. So um, so here fairness we um, mainly um talk about it through like the system levels uh, objective so um in 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 the city map basically we can partition it to different regions and uh, every region we can get the aggregated like a supply and demand at each time step so um basically okay. uh, the fairness here means every region's uh, supply demand ratio is close to the entire city or the global supply demand ratio so and uh, for example, here, this absolute value calculator, like uh, the difference, and basically we want to minimize this difference. And the sum is over like uh, all the regions and over uh, several time slots. Okay. So it's like the MPC idea, we, we consider uh, like uh, the next uh, three or five times, 10 steps. So yes. yeah. So that's okay. uh, uh, yeah, that's the fairness. And uh, um, for for robust optimization, the challenge here is this is not like a very good uh, uh, objective function in the sense that it's not a concave over the uncertain parameters. So that's why later we have some, uh, like a, a, we prove some approximations as this fractional format. But the key idea here is when we talk about fairness, we mean the supply demand ratio among different regions are quite close to the entire city's supply and demand ratio. Okay, very cool. And, and so maybe just uh, from the application point of view, do, can you give an idea of how large such a region is? Can you can I imagine this as a neighborhood or uh, is even smaller than that? Uh, um, so sure. Um, so for example, for the for the New York City, I think it's the basically it's the uh, the, the the Manhattan uh, Island area. So it's almost like yeah. the entire city. So for example, we we can partition the city to like a, a fifty to one hundred regions. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. So that kind of scale, and because. Here, um, our decision is about like the number of vehicles balanced among regions. It's not like a matching specific one vehicle to one uh, uh, passenger. So, so basically the, the size uh, or the complexity of the optimization problems is decided by like the number of region partitions and Absolutely. the number of time slots we consider here, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Very cool, very cool stuff. Uh, I, look, I will read the paper. Uh, now, now I'm very curious. Uh, let's see. So Pengbo has a question. 
Pengbo, you can uh, go ahead and ask. Hey. Hello, thanks for your interesting talks, Professor. Uh, actually, I have uh, several questions. Uh, also, uh, I'm basically uh, more interested in the first part. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's more some detailed information about this. Could you go back to your last slides? Sure. Yeah, so here you said that your decision variable is that you decide how many vehicles should be relocated from one region to another. Mm -hmm. So uh, my question is like, uh, if it's just the numbers, when you just point out which region you should go, then as in each region, when you partition it, actually it includes uh, several links, also intersections. Uh, do you make any decision, I mean, in a more lower level, like to tell them where to go? Uh, you mean, so for example, uh, goes from region one to region two, it can take different routes or something like that? Uh, uh, yes, the routes can be different. Also, uh, the positions, I mean, the, the recollection the... position also can be different. So do can can you comment a bit on that? Um, so that is more uh, basically uh, how we do it in the in the simulation level. So for example, in the simulation, uh, when when they assume like a, uh, these two vehicles, they are allocated to, for example, region one, and uh, they will uh, like, will randomly generate, uh, for example, locations in in region one uh, in the simulation process. So we specifically choose this vehicle balancing this decision on this like a region partition level. That's because we found out that. Uh, your literature work, uh, uh, there is a lot of work about, say, uh, matching a relatively small group of uh, vehicles to a small group of uh, passengers, right? So, for example, um, uh, 50 vehicles, that, that sort of level. Or there are also work, say, for example, doing large scale, um, like a city level uh, vehicle balancing. Um, but uh, neither of these work consider, for example, um, model uncertainties, sub, uh, prediction part of uncertainties. And we found out uh, uh, to solve this like a complicated uh, problem, it's hard to say I just uh, run one through, uh, uh, just uh, run through one optimization problem then I can solve the entire like a uh, uh, transportation decision uh, challenge, right? So it seems we have to see, make decision at uh, like a different scale or different uh, level and uh, the entire system work say through this sort of like a uh, uh, hybrid uh, decision-making way or like a heterogeneous decision-making way. So, so um, in our simulation, basically we just, uh, um, for, for example, for the local controller, we just uh, utilize uh, the, the very like a, a mature way of say, um, matching these specific vehicles to passengers. But that part, uh, um, we, we also have one conference paper uh, describing, uh, for example, like uh, how these, uh, uh, integer programming process integrate uh, with this sort of system level vehicle balancing. Yeah, but our main theoretical contribution comes in this like a system level vehicle balancing when they consider this model uncertainties. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, th thanks. And uh, then for your current work, what about the frequency that you make decision? How sure? Uh, yeah, I think that that's actually a, a very good question. So um, basically, uh, so, so um, for example, uh, like uh, in this uh, uh, data set through the uh, experiment, we didn't show uh, a lot of results like uh, in terms of the partition granularity here, but we did have that. So um, basically the system level we are balancing yearly, uh, balancing uh, every 30 minutes or every hour, the result is the best. So we also compare it say, okay, balancing every two hours, then it's like, a, that's too long. So the prediction error is too large. So that actually affects the system's uh, performance. Or uh, if we balancing uh, too frequently, for example, every 20 minutes, every 15 minutes, or even every 10 minutes, then that's also too much because at the, um, like a, 
at that gripping level, sometimes the vehicles not really finish some trips yet, right? So uh, uh, usually a better solution is um, do the system level, region level vehicle balancing every 30 minutes or every hour. And then within that hour, basically there is only local matching, uh, say um, basically some uh, uh, demand appear in this region, then you just match one uh, close, uh, weekend vehicle to pick up the passenger sample. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, maybe my last question. Uh, so on this slide, that uh, the figure on the right, you shows mm -hmm. the predicted su supply, also the predicted demand. I noticed that actually your prediction is always uh, right is bigger than the true historical data, both the supply and demand. In is that not, uh, no? Not, not, not always. So like uh, some regions are closed or uh, uh, slightly <laughs> lower, yeah. Uh, yes, I mean, maybe may maybe the first part, like from the 6 to 16. I mean, if uh, during this um, period, if uh, your prediction is always bigger than uh, the historical ones, and both for your supply and demise, will that have some uh, influence on your decisions? For example, if my uh, predicted demand is uh, bigger than the historical, but also the supply is bigger than the historical, maybe it won't change a lot. Uh, just uh, what I see through... from the figure. <laughs> um... I mean, maybe one is uh, bigger than the ground truth, but one is lower. I, I mean, the supply demand, it will influence the decision. But if both of them are bigger than the supply and demand, maybe it won't change that much. Uh, it, it, is that will influence the result? Um, we didn't specifically check. So for example, if both are bigger, what will happen? Um, but uh, actually this figure here, I think we pick up some specific region prediction. So not all the regions are like always bigger. And also the uncertainty sets we built, um, um, when we calculated the, uh, for example, the, 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 the second moment, we calculate the, both the mean and the covariance of the, of the prediction error. Uh, we, we did see it's like uh, uh, sometimes smaller, sometimes bigger. So it's not like a, a, a ellipsoid, like just always bigger than the real value. It, 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 the, so the, the, the distribution is not like that. So I, I think maybe specifically this, uh, just that this region, it uh, seems the the bigger times is uh, uh, is, uh, is is small. So, but uh, but for for the for the entire city is like a different regions prediction when they calculate the prediction error, we, we, we do see like a pre, pre, uh, we do see a distribution. It's not always bigger, always smaller. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. I I think that is like a aggregated for the or region of interest. If it's mm. just a sub region, maybe it. Yeah. Know, some. It, yeah. So. Exactly, and also uh, we do see like a prediction error at different regions can be uh, quite different, uh, and and and, uh, and uh, indeed like the the data quality also affects our prediction, right? So for for regions with like a a, a lot of data, and maybe for example a busy region or, or city region, so usually with more data, the prediction result is better. So in some rural areas, like the the the, the taxi service or the 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 the, the mobility on demand service that's also uh, smaller and uh, the, the data set basically is more sparse and uh, the prediction result is also usually worse. Yeah, so 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 you, you need this part, uh, uh, the, the data part uh, and the uh, different regions and different time, those uh, all like uh, uh, affect the prediction. Yeah, so, but, but, but here we'd rather say, okay, so um, instead of like analyzing what is the reason affect the prediction, but we just uh, want to see, can we have some more, uh, uh, some more like uh, statistical ways to uh, measure the prediction uncertainty and take that into account in the uh, vehicle balancing decisions. Okay, thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you for your questions. Thank you, Pengbo, for the nice questions. Uh, any other question? I think you you gave your coordinates in case people want to reach out for deeper questions after reading the papers. 
Sure. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Faye, for the exciting talk. I think there are a lot of uh, interesting things also for your future steps. I look mm -hmm. forward to follow the progress. Thank um, you. Thank you. It's also a very and, nice opportunity to 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 talk through Zoom, and I really hope to meet with some of you like in future conferences in person. Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, Zoom is pretty pretty easy to use, but then the the in person conference is better. I agree. All right, thank you very much, uh, and thank you all for participating. See you all for the next autonomy talk next week. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.